Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stero and Channing. Um, uh, Chinese leasing, I think, is, is here to stay, for sure. We'll be talking about it for many years to come. We're now moving on to uh, another discussion on shipping finance. The title of the session, Greek Ship Finance Landscape in the Years Ahead. Interestingly enough, we don't have any traditional shipping banks on our uh, panel here. We've got lots of other sources of uh, finance. Uh, our moderator, Mr. George Paleocrasas, partner and co-global uh, shipping head, Watson Farley and Williams. George, please. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you also to Kevin and Mia for arranging uh, the conference and, and insisting on it being in person because it, you know, after a year and a half, two years, it makes a very pleasant change. Um, I'd like to introduce the panelists today. As, as Kevin said, we don't have any traditional banks. We do have certain uh, people on the panel who used to be at banks. Uh, so we have Robert Jan Suget, the Managing Director of Direct Ship Finance, Ilias Saikelis, the CEO of Australis Maritime, Iraklis Tirigotis, Director of Origination at Neptune Maritime Leasing, Stefanos Frangos, the senior representative at the Athens branch of Yield Street Marine Finance, and Omer Donestein, the managing director of Entrust Global. Um, as uh, Kevin said, the, the panel is, uh, will be looking at Greek ship finance in the years ahead, but the, the way we will be structuring the discussion is to start off looking at the present, uh, and then moving forward to look at how things will change in the future or the expected landscape in the future. So I, I will just start off, at, you know, a number of the people on the panel here are, are very well known to, to you in the market, uh, have been active in the Greek market. And, and therefore, what I'd like to do is just start with a general question is where you currently see the opportunities in the, in the Greek market. Robert, do you want to? Sure. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Marie Money. Uh, obviously, happy to talk about uh, ship finance in general and more specifically about uh, direct ship finance. And also the fact that I can be on the panel and take off my face mask for half an hour or so is, uh, is, is much appreciated. Um, I, see, I see a lot of opportunities in, in the Greek market because of the, diversi the, the diversity of uh, ship owners. Uh, you know, uh, in the recent, recently everybody talked about the fact that ship finance was not uh, very much available. Uh, that for me is the, the glass is half empty approach. I think the, uh, I, I prefer the, the glass is half full approach, uh, giving the variety of ship finance possibilities that you have. And I see, if you look at the panel today, uh, I see you see five different approaches to the market and that creates good opportunities for a lot of ship owners to find something that really meets their requirements. And that is very different from the more, more, far more one-dimensional approach that we used to know with the traditional shipping banks. So I think the glass is half full. Uh, Ilya, do you want to? Uh... Sure. Uh, I, I uh, fully agree with uh, everything that was just said. I think um, uh, for the first time in many, many years, uh, this market, because of its depth and its quality, uh, will find itself uh, having access to a great variety of uh, financing products, be it in the capital markets or the private markets, um, away from, from the banks, which doesn't mean that the banks will not be there, it's just a healthy mix. In particular, um, when you're thinking about, if you like, the alternative uh, financing market, uh, the uh, flexibility and the non-recourse nature uh, that a lot of these projects represent will, will, uh, will bring a lot, of, um, a lot of flexibility from an ownership perspective. Thank you. And Irakli, if you want to take that, but also maybe start speaking about the type of um, sectors or deals or companies that you would be you are or will be targeting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a pleasure, first of all, to be here. Just to expand on what was already said about the opportunities in the Greek market, I think there is one more reason that makes a difference. Uh, the market turned at the right time because in Greece we have so many different sized companies 
and quite a few of them were in a difficult financial position before the market turned. And now also those companies will be able to reinvest uh, their profits uh, of the last one and a half, two years, uh, expand their fleet. So there will be even increased number of opportunities. That's what we think. That's why we have positioned ourselves like that. And we'll be able through Neptune Maritime Leasing to cover and serve and team up, most importantly, not only with the bigger players, that it's something that is relatively easy for probably all my fellow uh, panelists, but also the smaller size companies uh, that they want to re-engage in the business, to renew their fleets, and they want to have a trusted partner to do so. So we are covering the entire spectrum, both in terms of size, but also sectors. Uh, but of course, um, just to make caveat that, you know, when I'm saying sectors, I'm talking about the three to five most liquid segments, dry bulk tankers, container ships, and a bit of LNG and LPG. Thank you, Irakli. Stefano? George, first of all, thank you for the introduction, and it's a great pleasure. Many thanks to Mia and Kevin for organizing, finally, a physical uh, conference. It's very refreshing and great to see everyone here. So, uh, addressing your question, George, um, well, it's been a while, actually, that we've seen so many players in the ship financing scheme uh, engaging uh, over the last 9 to 12 months. So we've, we've seen uh, regional banks in Greece, in Cyprus, in, in Germany, uh, in the UK, etc., engaging deeply in this market. We've seen alternative lenders such as this panel here primarily, um, <clears throat> and not only us here, engaging uh, also in alternative lending. We've seen uh, leasing. So it's been a while where we've seen all of those players um, actively engage in that market. That prompts that there are plenty of opportunities out there. We see opportunities in the um, smaller ship owner space, wanting people, you know, seeing uh, the uh, positive spin of the market, wanting to um, uh, offload all their tonnage and stepping in uh, a different type of risk reward profile. Uh, we see um, larger institutional players wanting to take our offering, our money, which is shorter term bridge money to take advantage of opportunities. And uh, we see a lot of opportunity as well in the smaller ticket sizes. So seven to 15 million uh, is, is roughly uh, you know, the majority of, of the opportunities that we assess at this very moment. Thank you. Stefano, Omar. Thank you, George. Can you hear me? No. Thank you, George, and thank you, uh, Maureen Mani, for uh, putting this conference today here. Um, so for interest, we, you know, we started the business five, five, six years ago, and Greece has always been the primary market and primary focus for us for numbers, <coughs> number of reasons. Uh, one, this is a very you know, large market, um, very fragmented, uh, very, you know, the, the owners here are um, extremely entrepreneurial, which is very important you know, for guys like us who are looking for, um, you know, to team up with uh, ship owners that share a similar um, mindset. Um, in addition, relationship is a key factor here in Greece, and you know we've learned that um, you know especially in in, in a cyclical and, and volatile industry like shipping. I mean, when you know ships trade worldwide, I mean it's really the relationship, the bonds between the, the ship owner and the lender that carries uh, you know carries the relationship and um, and uh, helps the you know helps the, the the two sides to see eye to eye. Even in, even in uh, difficult markets, I think as far as your question, uh, you know, our focus we we've always um, uh, you know had a very uh, opportunistic approach to to shipping, similar to our clients. And there is no good or bad sectors or good or bad markets. Uh, there is only good or bad deals. Um, and for us, good or bad a, a good deal is one that both parties are on the same page. They you know they share the same incentives. Uh, and they both profit from uh, from good market, and that's th these are the type of deals that we'll continue doing. Thank you, Omar. I mean, I think it's safe to say that the, the, the majority or all, all of you, when you do your deals, are mostly done on leasing structures. 
and I, I know there's, there's a flexibility, and I, I can see already Leah shaking his head, so, uh, so this will come to you first, but in terms of, and taking Omer's point as well about, you know, having, having a deal where, you know, that both parties are correctly incentivized, or there's an alignment, let's say, of incentives, is, is that a feature of, of looking at structuring deals that way? So, Ilya, over to you. Sure, look, um, and it's funny because we were mentioning this on a, a conversation earlier this morning. Uh, when people ask us what's the most important thing in terms of uh, doing the, these deals, we would say that um, hopefully the owners with whom we work view us as their partners instead of their lenders. Um, and this is a slight di distinction to when you're talking, I'm guessing, to a traditional bank. And the reason is either we're financing obviously at much higher leverage levels or we're financing assets which for whatever other reason are not easy to uh, finance at that time in the cycle. And therefore, there has to be a lot more um, al alignment of interest, exa exactly as you said. On the loan versus lease, to be perfectly honest with you, we are agnostic. and. Um, uh, from an economic perspective, we're completely agnostic. They're both priced the same way as far as we are concerned. At the end of the day, we're always uh, financiers, we're not owners, uh, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but we are trying to fit the right structure to, to the right project and to the right deal. And as I mentioned before, uh, you know, uh, a large part of the of our of our portfolio obviously is on a non-recourse basis. So this is really project financing, and you know, uh, one structure that doesn't really fit all. Um, so that's the approach we take. Okay, thank you very much, Ilya. Uh, Robert, do you want to? Uh... No, I just want to make a quick remark about um, uh, the fact that we are all into leasing, uh, direct share finances. Uh, we are an alternative to the far more traditional bank product. So we are not in leasing, we do senior secured financing. Uh, the only difference I think uh, uh, we have compared to the more traditional bank uh, product is that we have a lot more flexibility and uh, uh, I think a lot more creativity to structure a deal around a specific project. Uh, and that's where we make the difference apart from the fact that we can deliver also in a far quicker way than, uh, than, uh, than the average bank. But we do, in that sense, um, a more traditional senior good banking product, just to clarify. Okay, thank you. I mean, just, just to take this point about the, the flexibility, because I think, I think, you know, in many of the discussions with certain people on this panel, with other, with other um, people who are called alternatives, finance providers, that, that seems to be a very big selling point, something that, you know, that you use to distinguish yourselves from banks. So, you know, maybe if you sort of want to develop this a little bit more, what is the flexibility that you're able to offer? I'll, I'll start with Omer. Now. Sure. Um, look, I, I think ultimately, you know, every fund that you speak with will tell you that they're quick. Um, <coughs> being able to deliver funds within, you know, weeks rather than months. Uh, but flexibility is not only on funding time and, you know, it's on structure. So you mentioned George Leasing. I mean, from Entra side, we, we've actually, uh, the majority of our book is, is, is loans and not leases. And this is driven by the, the borrower, not, not, not ourselves. And uh, for many of our clients, it, was, it is important to structure the, the financing as, as loan. And we've, you know, we've, um, we've accommodated it. In addition, you know, flexibility uh, comes in forms of... Um, you know, uh, things like amortization profiles, uh, the ability to build security, um, security cash over time rather than day one, which minimizes the, the, you know, the day one cash that an owner has to put in. Uh, but to me, flexibility is really it comes on the downside. And at times, the difficult times that, that, you know, that both parties need to sit down and figure out how to get out of a tough market. I mean, this is really where, um, where we, I think we're different than some of the, you know, some other more traditional uh, financial institutions that are just, you know, not that they don't share the same view, but they are burdened with more, more bureaucracy and red tape, um, which is something that um, is not the case here. I think for the majority of the, the people sitting on this panel, you're actually speaking with decision makers. So, you know, when 
when something comes up and, and, and the questions about um, the restructuring amendment, we can get back to you right away with what is doable and not have to go back to um, restructuring committee and other uh, credit committee in the banks that may have, the, may have a different view. Okay, thank you, Omer. Stefan, I mean, if you want to also uh, answer to this point, I mean, you mentioned before about the, the deal size that you, you know, that you are able to offer, which is also a distinguishing factor, maybe from, from many other people in the market, but other elements of flexibility as well. And maybe, and I, and I like Omer's point as well about, you know, the lack of bureaucracy that you're speaking to decision makers. Is that the same within your organization, within the Yield Street? Thanks, George. Uh, yes, to a large extent it is. Um, oh, there's another common uh, aspect within trust that we share in Omer, uh, which is uh, that primarily our book is based on uh, vanilla loans, on senior secured vanilla loans, as opposed to um, leasing and sale and leasebacks, even though we do have uh, sale and leasebacks on our books. And uh, there are for specific reasons we would end up doing sale and leasebacks uh, under a confined structure, so to say. But other than that, on the uh, flexibility aspect, uh, I think where um, perhaps we are being viewed, in addition to being a quick and having a longer term repayment profiles or even uh, for select deals, especially on the tanker side, we are able to offer even non-armored uh, structures for uh, six or nine months. The other aspect that uh, we are able to deliver our funding on is based on no uh, prepayment or exit penalties. So uh, by nature, our funding is uh, short to medium term, which is six months to three years. So we are saying that there is no a request for a prepayment uh, penalty uh, so long as the first six month, uh, months are completed. So that's another aspect of, of flexibility that, that we do offer. And um, uh, essentially, that has been lead on, on the restructuring side. Yes, I mean, we are dealing, we've got a small agile team in Athens that uh, represent the shipping hub of Hill Street. So naturally, um, even though decisions are blessed by our senior management, essentially they are pre-baked and done here in Athens. So w we do engage quickly in delivery. Thank you very much, uh, Stefane. And Irakli, I mean, do you want to sort of uh, describe a little bit about the structure within Neptune and uh, uh, the, the flexibility you're, you're offering and, and sort of the decision-making uh, structure as well? Uh, absolutely. Actually, my answer would be pretty simple because everything is here in Athens. So we're just around the corner, pretty much. Uh, all decisions are taken here. Um, as most of the people know, our um, corner store investor also has a very significant Greek presence, to say the least, um, <laughs> if I put it mildly. Um, and, and basically, we have a very lean organization. It's a small team. Uh, all decisions are taken just a matter of a few days. And to be more specific, from the moment that we are discussing about uh, the key terms and conditions until the day of disbursement. Uh, I will say realistically it will take anything between six and eight weeks um, until the moment that actually funds leave the door, which we think as a starting point is pretty competitive and um, the focus at the moment is to become even more um, efficient on how we do things and reduce the time to four weeks, be able to provide our commitment in a matter of hopefully one to two weeks. Um, and for any ticket size that is larger than 15 million, uh, we can move pretty fast. Okay, well, thank you very much. If we, if we sort of look at, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that Kevin mentioned is, you know, talked about one identifying there's no traditional banks here on this panel, which is for this panel is unusual, but, but you know, we, we have seen, and, and reference was made to it before, that there is, particularly in the Greek market, the Greek banks have been very active and continue to be very active. The banks in Cyprus as well are active in, in this market. So while there has been retrenchment from may, many of the bigger players and, and a focus actually on, for those bigger banks, on, on a select number or a select type in the market of ship owner, 
that does leave a, big, a very, very big opportunity, and, and you've covered the, the, you know, the reference to the opportunity. But, I mean, how, you know, from your side, uh, are you viewing this as a sort of, you know, an opportunity that exists right now, that there's a gap in the market? Do you, do you think that this gap will continue going forward? And therefore, is your commitment to, to the market something, you know, long-term, a medium-term commitment, or is it something more speculative that you just see that there's an opportunity right now? Now, we as direct ship finance, we are definitely here for, uh, for the long run. Um, we are maybe together with Neptune, uh, the newest kid on the block, but we have $400 million of committed capital uh, with a group of investors. And, and if we do uh, what we told them that we would do, we can grow with the same group of investors to, uh, to a substantially larger amount. So we are there definitely for the, for the long run. Um, and again, I, I, of course, in, here in the Greek market, you have the local Greek banks. Uh, uh, and that, is, that, is, that, is, that is definitely the case. But the pool here in Greece is, is, is large enough to find uh, uh, sufficient business opportunities, and I would simply say also to the Greek owners, um, uh, talk to different parties who are offering different products and find something that really meets your, your requirements. And I think with the panel here and with the offerings from uh, maybe the more traditional Greek banks, there's a lot, a lot on the table. So again, I mean, the glass is half full, I think, for the Greek market. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Look, um, le let me start by saying that when you are asking a question about whether what we represent uh, has a future longer term, uh, you need, really need to ask the uh, que question, do you deliver value to the end user? Do, do you deliver so something which is valuable in the longer term to, to the ownership uh, community? And the, and the short answer is yes. And the reason simply put is that uh, the diversity of funding sources throughout the cycle, not at the same time when the cycle is strong, but throughout the cycle, good market or bad market, is great for any owner. So for, for that reason alone, even be, before you look at supply and demand of shipping credit, which is obviously uh, there is a massive gap that continues to grow, would point to a very bright future for all sorts of financing products uh, to uh, uh, diversify that. The second point that we always make is that actually banks are our partners. And if you look at the way we set up Borealis and Australis, one of the uh, pillars of that was to help the banking community, help the banking community get out of uh, situations they wanted to get out and deliver, help the banking community get assets off the balance sheets, help the banking uh, community um, uh, refinance, not non-performing, but perhaps non-core uh, expo exposures. And we will continue to do that. The second reason why there are partners is, as pro probably a, lo a, lo a lot of you know, a lot of these banks are financing us as well. Uh, and therefore, we are able to lower our co cost of capital and, pa and pass it through to the shipping community, making in turn the original pro uh, product even more competitive and more, and more attractive. So it's a bit of a virtual cycle, which uh, there's no reason why it won't continue. You're absolutely right. The Greek banks have been very, very active over the last uh, ca couple of years. But, you know, uh, cycles come and go, and, you know, there will be space for all of us, uh, especially go going back to the size and the depth of this, of this particular market in Greece. Thank you, Ilya. And, and just one point on this, you know, on the, on the back financing of yourselves. I mean, there you see there is an interest from certain banks who, who appear, and I, I don't want to speak for them, but appear to have less interest to, to do the deals themselves. That they're, that, they're, that they're financing. And this is regulatory arbitrage, basically. Uh, instead of uh, sh sh ship lending in structured finance, they need to, uh, they need to put aside le 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 less capital. It's, it's, more, it's more economically accretive to them, and that's why they do it. Okay. Thank you very much, Ilya. Irakli, do you want to uh, continue on, on this point? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I also touch upon the innovation side of things, because now we are five. I remember a few years ago, really leasing was alternative. In the previous panel, uh, a figure was mentioned, 65 billion. 
So not any more small amounts. And this is growing fast. So the opportunities are there, clearly. The demand for capital will only increase because we're talking about larger nominal amounts, either because of inflation or because of new technologies or whatever is the reason. So the demand is there. And the fact that we are so many parties now offering this, um, I don't want to use the word alternative because in my eyes it's not alternative anymore. It becomes mainstream more and more. And the more competition, healthy competition is between us, the more competitive the product will be, and the closer, and you know, the, the, the gap will be narrower and narrower between what the banks are offering now and what probably will be offering in the next few years. Specifically for Neptune, we are also trying to make that even more, how to say, exotic by introducing um, concept of tokenization we're exploring internally, how tokenization also could make a nice break to environmental aspects. So all these features will only allow us to unlock new source of capital that until very recently were not available. I'm talking about insurance companies, I'm talking about pension funds, I'm talking about the big players that they have so much capital to deploy and we would like to be basically there for them and on the other hand as a trusted partner, partner for our um, uh, companies, uh, the shipping companies that we're going to team up with. Okay, thank you, Iragri. I, I just wanted, I mean, the point you've made now about, because we've heard this before, you know, that attracting insurance companies, other investors who are, who are not in shipping. I mean, have you seen this? I mean, I'll, I'll ask this to Stefanos and also Omer. Are you seeing this as well? Are you getting these approaches? And you can also talk about, you know, how you see the interplay between what you offer in the banks as well. Um, just on the first point, I uh, just want to introduce the um, <clears throat> aspect of seasonality in traditional bank money flowing in and out of the market. And we've, we've seen, we've experienced that to a uh, large degree in the last 12 months where banks have re-entered very strongly uh, that part of the market, the funding market, the vanilla senior secured loans. So, so long as there is this um, seasonality or cyclicality in bank money flowing in and out for various reasons, regulation, underlying shipping markets, etc., then um, alternative lenders uh, will always be relevant to fill that void uh, to the extent it is larger or continuing to do business and tag along with banks uh, via back leverage or otherwise to continue uh, to support the shipping industry. So we will continue, all of us, be relevant for many year, many more years to come. Um, with respect to uh, different types of capital um, flowing in the industry on the alternative lending side, I'd say, yes, we've seen insurance money, uh, big tickets, um, uh, taking a view in the longer run, um, We've, we've seen other more opportunistic players yields it by itself in its DNA. We represent retail money, so thousands of U.S. Um, investors that uh, flow in to take advantage of opportunities in a number of areas, uh, including shipping. So there are indeed many different pockets of capital wanting to support shipping. And of course, uh, when shipping is in happy days, as it is now, um, you know, that space is getting overcrowded with different interests, including insurance money. I do agree with that. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. So j just to touch on some of the points that were raised here earlier, uh, I think, we you know, when we started uh, the shipping business in Entrust, we, our view was, uh, you know, as you mentioned, that uh, liquidity is cyclical. And, you know, and that means that we did not want to be a monoline business, that all we do is provide, uh, you know, single products, senior loans to the market. Because we knew that if we take this approach at some point, uh, you know, we'll have to face the banks that uh, will come back to, um, to the shipping market. So our view has always been that we are not a shipping lender, but we are a shipping investor. And as such, we've done everything from, um, you know, from senior secure loan to, um, to um, equity and everything in between. And we've been active in the, in the primary market and the secondary market and the, the, mostly on the private side, but also on the, on the public markets as well. And I think, you know, I can share with the audience that, um, you know, over the last 12 months, we have been taken out um, 
three, four, five loans by Greek shipping banks that you know we see uh, that are coming in. You know, values have been uh, increasing in some segments. And, you know, they've refinanced us at, um, at a lower cost, and you know, we are very happy for the. Uh, for the for the borrowers that they could um, you know um, do that and reduce their cost of funding. I mean that's really what our you know our role in this in, in the value chain. I mean we're not um, looking to stick around for five seven years, uh, but rather to provide you know to fill that liquidity gap um, and at the right point in time. Now another point on the on kind of like the the the, the different or the variety of products that we. Uh, we produce, we, we provide is the fact that, you know, at these, at these days we feel um, in certain segments that we're more comfortable taking more risk. Again, I mentioned equity. We are uh, concluding today, actually, in, uh, as we speak, the, a large acquisition of the mass capital portfolio from ABN. Uh, and um, this is something that Entrust, uh, with the help of the mass capital team that are here today with me, are very happy to will be um, you know will be focusing more so you know for us um, you'll see us doing more you know more equity deals um, more opportunistic deals than you know than we might we may have done in, in the past acknowledging that banks in this current liquidity environment are going to be more active okay thank you Omar we've been given the five minutes signed by uh, by Kevin I, I mean just to sort of wrap up as well but but it, it seems from what I'm hearing here that, that there is a commitment from the people on this panel to 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 the market that there is a belief that there will be a coexistence between them and the and the banks and and I also I mean I agree with the, the statement that well the alternative tag seems a bit odd now I mean it may have been made sense at the very beginning but it's you know it's certainly beyond alternative but but um, but one last area I wanted to cover is the impact of ESG, so environmental social governance, which, which particularly has a big impact on banks. So, you know, just very quickly to go around, how big is the impact on you currently? How do you, you know, how do you see that developing? And also, what does it mean, for, let's say, for for Greek owners with, with older tonnage? What, what, how does that affect them as well? I know it's sort of three questions into one, but <laughs> who wants to go first? Um, look, I think pu putting aside the, the distinction about uh, bank and non-bank lenders, overall the ship financing community obviously has two missions from our perspective. The first mission is to encourage and support the uh, transition to uh, cleaner modes of transportation. The second one, and that might be counterintuitive perhaps, but the, the second one is to extend the life of the existing fleet as much as possible, because that's the cleanest way uh, to, to move forward for uh, uh, shipping. Uh, you know, in a lot of these panels, in a lot of these uh, articles, nobody talks about, uh, you know, the environmental impact of uh, rebuilding the entire fleet, of scrapping the, the existing fleet. How do you do it? So that requires time. It will happen and it requires time. So our mission is, two, is twofold, both the first and the, and the second. Interestingly enough, of course, when you start to think about the distinction now of the financing sources, there are slightly uh, different uh, perspectives and incentives. And from our perspective, uh, and I'll give you a few, a few examples of what we've done already, um, in terms of uh, facilitating the uh, transition, obviously, we've, uh, we've financed uh, dual-fuel dual uh, new buildings, we've uh, financed uh, battery pack in, uh, installations, we've financed scrubber installations, we can argue whether or not that's environmentally friendly, but um, so we will, of course, do, do that on an economic basis. Uh, if economically those projects make sense, we will do that. On the other hand, because our mandate is much, much broader and more uh, flexible, as we all mentioned at the beginning of this panel, we are also very happy and very able to finance older, older vessels. And we take a view of what realistically is the useful life of this tonnage, depending on which segments they're trading in, and the technical requirements, the commercial requirements, much more importantly. And we can do that when a lot of banks now we, uh, will set a 10-year-old limit or a 5-year-old limit even. 
and we obviously are much more open to, uh, to uh, finance older tonnage as well. I'd like to make a comment about ESG because, um, you know, ESG is everywhere. And every time that we, uh, you know, in every investor meeting that we have in Europe, I mean, the, the, the issue always comes up. Um, and we see more and more in the U.S. when, you know, the, this, which is lagging Europe, but, but still, you know, we get questions from pension funds. What do we do in the space? And I think for, you know, the, generally there's, uh, there's some confusion about ESG. ESG is not a goal. It's a, it's mindset. It's a mindset. It's the approach that uh, we as investors have to take to, uh, to a business. Um, and I completely agree with, with Elias and the point that he made, but again, there is more than just the E in ESG. There are other factors um, that are very, you know, very important, I think, for, you know, for us, for every business. And there are many, you know, many studies that shows that companies that are more mindful to ESG do better in the long run. And that extends to the shipping industry. And, and at the end of the day, this also, you know, these are the kind of, of partners that, that folks like ourselves would like to team up with. If I just add uh, a few more comments to that. Um, everyone knows the need for, of course, greener vessels, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going to say more about that. Um, what I want to say is that the need is there for greener ships, but there are so many big question marks. Uh, also, we heard this morning about placing orders for new builds. Nowadays, it's very hard. What kind of fuel are you going to choose? The technologies and the likes. So that's why innovation, I will repeat the same thing, is crucial to bridge the gap for the next few years. Uh, for instance, uh, carbon credits is something that has not been widely used um, across the globe or, or many sectors, but it's used more and more as a way to bridge the gap. Uh, um, I've mentioned already the fact that there are already uh, some solutions out there that we're exploring to offset the fact that we might finance a vessel that might be a bit older or might not be uh, bearing the latest technologies by offsetting that carbon emissions with uh, tokens that represent uh, basically planting new trees in the Amazon forest. So all these are innovative solutions that basically can bridge the gap and I think are going to be required and will have more value going forward rather than having a static approach of just new builds with technologies that nobody knows what could be, you know, be used in the future. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just one thing that, uh, by, again, by nature of our business at Yield Street, where we've got all those different verticals, uh, real estate, private business, credit, shipping, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, we've been involved in launching to our investor public an ESG-themed portfolio, and we'll continue doing all those initiatives um, as we move along. From our shipping perspective, our key focus is supporting our key clientele, which is the smaller, mid-sized ship owner, my sense is that for now they've got sort of different priorities. Uh, that is not meant to say that, uh, you know, ESG is not in their agenda. I don't see that in the very foreseeable future for them, for the smaller ship owner. Nonetheless, we uh, team up and we partner with good quality smaller ship owners that are environmentally conscious. So. Thank you, Stefan. And Robert, do you want to conclude? Just a, just a short remark. I mean, if you're the last one to react to a question, you always run the risk of uh, repeating what has already been said. And especially because everybody's looking forward to lunch, I'll, I'll be short. Um, uh, the ESG question is a very important question. Maybe it is the important, most important question. But from our perspective, um, as direct chip finance, we focus on second-hand tonnage. We, we are in the market to do Elderly, elderly tonnage as such. So um, we follow the discussion, we support the discussion, uh, but we don't, do not see ourselves as a front runner in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, subject. Um, uh, because I very much agree with, uh, with the remark made, and then I'm repeating what has already been said, but I very much agree with the fact that uh, uh, making use, making efficient use of the existing fleet is, is key in this transition period. I mean, I think this morning in the first panel by the Nows and Ten, they were very realistic, uh, uh, important uh, remarks to make that it takes time. It's not something we can do overnight. And now Kevin tells me to. <laughs>
Okay. Well, thank you very much to all the panelists. I, I hope everyone enjoyed the, the discussion uh, uh, today. And now I think we're, uh, you know, you he you've heard we're breaking for lunch. Okay, we're going to break for lunch. Thank you very much to George and the panel. Uh, we're breaking for lunch for one and a half hours, so let's reconvene, please, at three o'clock. Three o'clock. Lunch is in the room next door, and uh, as you pass through past the uh, buffet, you can uh, load.